at a solemn assembly held in the Kirtland Temple on April 6, 1837, the prophet taught, quote, After all that has been said, the greatest and most important duty is to preach the gospel. Close quote. Almost precisely seven years later, on April 7, 1844, Joseph Smith delivered a sermon known today as the King Follett Discourse. He declared in that address, quote, The greatest responsibility in this world that God has laid upon us is to seek after our dead, close quote. But how can preaching the gospel and seeking after our dead both be the single greatest duty and responsibility God has placed upon us? I believe the prophet Joseph Smith was emphasizing in both statements the fundamental truth that covenants entered into through authoritative priesthood ordinances can bind us to the Lord Jesus Christ and are the essential core of the work of salvation and exaltation on both sides of the veil. Missionary and temple and family history work are complementary and interrelated aspects of one great work that focuses upon the sacred covenants and ordinances that enable us to receive the power of godliness in our lives and ultimately return to the presence of Heavenly Father. Thus, the two statements by the prophet that initially may appear contradictory, in fact, highlight the focal point of this great Latter-day work. Hi, this is Ben. Thank you for listening to the Hope in Christ podcast. This is our concluding episode from our study of the Old Testament books Ezra and Nehemiah. We've studied half of the book of Ezra and half of Nehemiah and learned about the Jews working to rebuild the temple in Jerusalem, and we followed along with Nehemiah as he and others worked through extreme opposition to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. Today, we're going to have a chance to study a little bit about a man named Ezra, and something both he and Nehemiah each did to help the Jews in their time that can also be a good reminder to us. But, to help us understand more about who Ezra was, and to enlighten your understanding, I'd like to take you back to Babylon, where the Jews were living before their return to Jerusalem. Have you ever noticed that the life of the Old Testament Israelites seems to be a little different from the life of the Jews in Jerusalem during Christ's ministry? If you've paid close attention to the Old and New Testaments, you've probably seen some of the differences. Have you ever wondered where some of those differences came from? For example, why do the Jews in the New Testament have something called the synagogue? Who are the group of men called the scribes, and where did they come from? Why did the Jews not speak Hebrew anymore? And where did all of the extra Jewish rules surrounding the Law of Moses come from? And if we combine all of those questions into one, where did Judaism come from? Let's take a look at the answers to each of those questions, and most of it actually goes back to Babylon. Years before the Jews were carried off into Babylon, the prophet Hosea prophesied of a time when Israel would be taken captive and would have to live without the leadership of a righteous king, without God's temple, and without the ordinances of sacrifice. He also prophesied that they would go without a prophet, without the Urim and Thummim, which represented the revelators of God. While the Jews were in Babylon, Hosea's prophecy for Judah became their reality. Without a temple, a prophet, the ordinance of sacrifice, or a righteous king, their way of life absorbed a Babylonian lifestyle. Even the Babylonian name of the royal Jewish descendant Zerubbabel was evidence that in only a few decades in Babylon, the Jews had adopted a lot of the Babylonian culture. When the Jews began returning to Jerusalem, they took with them new ideas and a different religious lifestyle. While the Jews were in Babylon, their religious practices began to be transformed into what we recognize today as Judaism. Here are a few of the more important aspects of the Jews' religion that developed during their time in Babylon. And you'll notice that most of these took place because the Jews no longer had a temple. First, the writings of the prophets, especially Moses, were kept and honored among the Jews. Before the destruction of Jerusalem, the centerpiece of Jewish worship had been the temple and its sacrificial ordinances pointing them to Jesus Christ. But without a temple and sacrifices to focus on, the Jews placed greater emphasis on the law of Moses. 
Second, once again, because Jews no longer had the temple, the center for their religious worship was gone. Wanting to have some form of central worship, the Jews established a local synagogue as a new center for their religious observance. The synagogues took the place of the temple and became the place where they met, studied, and reverenced the law of Moses. Even after the temple in Jerusalem was rebuilt, the use of local synagogues didn't go away, and even today the synagogue is a most important part of Jewish community worship today. Third, because the Jews began to so strongly emphasize the law of Moses because they were missing the more important temple-centric elements of their faith, they started creating additional interpretations of the law of Moses and extra rules surrounding the law that would help them prevent from breaking it. While the upper-class Jews remained in Babylon, many of them started putting together a collection of those oral or spoken traditions, meaning that they weren't necessarily written down, but they were remembered and passed down verbally. Those oral traditions were eventually written in a record that has become one of the central texts of Judaism, called the Talmud. In many ways, those man-made traditions would take on greater authority in Judaism than the scriptures themselves. Fourth, with no temple to serve in, the Levite priests had to take up another practice. Many of them became really familiar with the scriptures and even became known as the experts in scripture and in the law of Moses. This group was known as the scribes, and they played a big role in Judaism during the times of the New Testament. And fifth, while in Babylon, Hebrew was replaced by Aramaic as the common language of the Israelite people. Aramaic was the primary language of the region and continued to be the primary language even through the days of Jesus Christ. But because the scriptures were written in Hebrew and not in Aramaic, as generations went by, fewer and fewer people knew the Hebrew language, making the scribes that much more powerful because they became some of the only ones who could read the sacred writings of the scriptures in Hebrew, which can also cause some problems. So there are just a few insights that should help you understand the transition in the culture of the Jews as they returned to Jerusalem and even in the years ahead as we enter the New Testament. When the Jews finally laid the foundation work for the reconstructed temple in Jerusalem, they held a celebratory ceremony. They had the Levites and the priests dress in their priestly robes and had trumpets. And Ezra chapter 3 says that they sang together and praising and giving thanks unto the Lord because he is good for his mercy endureth forever toward Israel. And all the people shouted with a great shout when they praised the Lord, because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. But many of the priests and Levites and chief of the fathers who were ancient men that had seen the first house, when the foundation of this house was laid before their eyes, wept with a loud voice, and many shouted aloud for joy so that the people could not discern the noise of the shout of joy from the noise of the weeping of the people. For the people shouted with a loud shout, and the noise was heard afar off. This is over seventy years now since the destruction of Jerusalem's temple. So here among the people who were there rebuilding it are a group of older Israelites who were alive when Jerusalem and the first temple were destroyed, and when the people were all carried off to Babylon. And as they see the temple's foundation that day, they can't hold back their emotion, and there they are in the crowd just weeping tears of joy and shouting. Can you imagine what they must have been feeling? In their youth, they saw the wickedness that existed among the Jews. Perhaps they had been part of the riotous and wicked living in their teenage years in Jerusalem, and because of all the wickedness, these young people watched the Babylonian army set fire to God's temple, and they watched it burn to the ground until it was completely destroyed. It has now been over 70 years since they've had God's temple in their midst. And now, here they are, not only seeing the temple being built, but they're now choosing to be a part of it. I can only imagine the intense joy and excitement that must have filled their hearts as they could no longer contain their emotion and they loudly cried out weeping tears of joy. The Jews worked to complete the reconstruction project of rebuilding the temple in Jerusalem, but still faced some opposition and their enemies went to report the Jews to the Persian king. By now, both King Cyrus and his son, the next king, had died, 
and the new king of Persia was King Darius. Darius not only allowed the Jews to keep building the temple, but he also gave them some Persian tax income to help them build it. He said, Let the work of this house of God alone. Let the governor of the Jews and the elders of the Jews build this house of God in his place. Moreover, I make a decree, what ye shall do to the elders of these Jews for the building of this house of God, that of the king's goods, even of the tribute beyond the river, forthwith expenses be given unto these men, that they be not hindered. Doesn't it make you feel good to read about the government recognizing the true God of heaven and issuing legislation and even an executive order to support and protect the building of the temple of God so that ordinances can be performed and prayers offered up on behalf of the leaders of nations? It's great to see that same kind of support from some nations around the world today. Some nations have seen God's church working to build temples on their nation's soil. And when they find out about the nature of temple work and the goodness of the Latter-day Saints, they willingly work to allow or even invite the church to bring the temple to their nation and to their people. The temple in Jerusalem was completed around the year 515 BC and would stand for nearly 600 years until a few decades after Christ's death and resurrection when in AD 70 it was sieged and destroyed by the Romans. Back to our story, a few decades after the temple was rededicated, and even a few decades after the Persian king Darius died, is when Ezra comes into the story. At nearly the same time that Nehemiah was allowed to go back to build up the walls of Jerusalem, a righteous man named Ezra is also sent back to Jerusalem by the same king. Ezra was born and raised in Babylon and was a descendant of Aaron, a priest in the Aaronic priesthood, and a Levite. That meant that had Ezra been born at a time when God had a house or temple on the earth, Ezra would have served in the temple. But because there had been no temple in Babylon, Ezra and other priests took up the practice of becoming a scribe, meaning that he became an expert in the scriptures and in the law of Moses. We have no evidence that he was a prophet, but he did know the scriptures well and wanted to do God's work. Ezra and Nehemiah each worked in Jerusalem to reform the people. Ezra worked to reform them spiritually, and Nehemiah also worked to bring them back to obedience to God. When Ezra and Nehemiah arrived in Jerusalem, around 445 BC, give or take a couple of years, they found the Jews living beneath their privileges as God's covenant people. Many of the Jews had been put into slavery by other Jews. Others were marrying outside of God's covenant, something that had been forbidden by the Lord. Ezra read the scriptures to the Jews and encouraged them to return to keeping the Sabbath day holy and give to the poor. Ezra and Nehemiah worked hard to reverse those trends and bring God's people back into alignment with His commandments so they could enjoy happiness and prosperity and a closeness to God. Both Ezra's and Nehemiah's efforts helped save the Jews at Jerusalem from another quick abandonment of God's law and of their true identity as God's covenant children. Neither of them were prophets, neither of them spoke in the name of the Lord, but as regular righteous men, they did their best to spread the gospel and influence others to awake from a spiritual sleep, brush off the dust, see things as they really are, and renew and keep their covenants with God. Earlier, I mentioned Hosea's prophecy that the Israelites would one day live without a prophet and without a temple. In that same prophecy, Hosea goes on to say that after the people of Israel go without these things for many days, that afterward they will return and seek the Lord Jesus Christ and His goodness in the latter days. As you know, that's our day. At the time period we're covering in the Old Testament, when the Jews rebuild Jerusalem, Pretty much all of the Old Testament prophets have lived and died. Only the last few prophets like Malachi and maybe Joel will follow. And in just a few years, even they will be gone. The books of Ezra and Nehemiah finish the end of the history of the Old Testament. So from the time period where our story ends today, and for these thousands of years since, even until today, most of the Israelites have been without a true prophet without revelators, and without God's temple, and without His ordinances and covenant blessings. The covenant people of the Lord are scattered among the nations, and just like those in Jerusalem, many of them have forgotten who they are. 
They don't know that God has called a prophet on the earth today. Some even today are struggling to keep the Sabbath day holy. Some of them haven't yet heard in this life about the great covenant of the Lord that promises eternal life to the faithful. They haven't yet entered the waters of His baptism, and they haven't been endowed with power in God's holy temple. Our job is to be the Ezra's and the Nehemiah's, to go out among them, to go to work, to find them, to remind them, even those who are already covenant members of Christ's church, and to lift them up, lovingly remind them who they really are, and invite them to come unto Christ and yoke themselves to Him as they join Him in His great work of gathering all Israel together in one. How will we do this? There are so many ways. Perhaps this weekend, you might select just one talk from the most recent General Conference and study it, looking for ways that you can help. I pray the Lord's greatest blessings upon you as you participate in perhaps one of the greatest works this world has ever known. We truly are doing a great work, and the purpose and prize are so great that surely we cannot afford to come down. Thank you for listening to all five scripture highlights from the Old Testament books of Ezra and Nehemiah. Next week, we get to study the book of Esther. I hope you're enjoying this podcast. If you know someone who might enjoy hearing these daily scripture highlights or who might benefit from the messages we shared this week, please tell them about it, or you can send them a link to your favorite episode. If you haven't yet, you might even consider rating this podcast on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, or drop a quick review on Apple Podcasts, letting other listeners know if you enjoy these relevant scripture highlights. I love you, and so does the Lord. Have an excellent day, a peaceful Sabbath this weekend. Enjoy your scripture study, and as you join in God's great work, watch how the Lord will increase your joy and hope in Christ.